Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, our guest is Shane Evans. Shane is a children's book illustrator, an author and painter and storyteller and musician. He worked at Rolling Stone Magazine, Hallmark Cards, and his work has been featured on The Oprah Winfrey Show, The Today Show, Reading Rainbow, and Late Night with David Letterman. He has illustrated close to 50 titles. The most recent illustrated book, My Friend, written by longtime friend and actor Ty Diggs. Shane has been awarded the Jane Addams Peace Award, the Coretta Scott King Award, and the NAACP Image Award. Shane is also the creator and illustrator of the Shauna book series, which spurred a television show called Shane's Kindergarten Countdown. He is currently working on a musical and art concept that was inspired by the meeting of Malcolm X and Martha Luther King called MM2000. Well, welcome Shane. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You have so many offerings, um, most recently a project with Ty Diggs. Can you tell us about your journey to this project? Well, Tay and I, we've been friends since before he was actually Tay. When he was uh, Scott Diggs back in high school, we started to collaborate, if you might, if you might say that, in collaboration of just being friends, really, and you know, evolving that into a family dynamic, really. So from that kind of tender age of sophomores in high school all the way through to college, we went to Syracuse together. And then as we kind of started to develop in our professional world, we found it very important to remain in connection as friends and as family. And then we also started to see the importance of developing visuals and sounds and music and et cetera. And what about this this book that you did with him? How did you get to that point? The My Friend Evolution started, we started with this book called Chocolate Me that uh, he wrote a piece while we were in college, a poem actually called Chocolate Me for a project that I had you know, thought about putting together in relationship to, you know, what it meant to to be a Black person. The, the project was called Blackness, but really more just an evolution or a thought, thought process around, you know, what it is to be, I think, in, in retrospect, like what it is to be a human, really, and each person's experience specifically. So he had written this piece called Chocolate Me. And then I had had this piece for so long after college, when I started into the publishing world, it kind of really just dawned on me one day that it really made sense. that It could be a beautiful picture book. So that started, uh, that started us into the publishing world. And we did another book called Mixed Me, which I think had a lot to do with us as parents. We did a book called I Love You More Than, which also, you know, kind of extended the idea of parent relationship and child relationship. And then my friends seem to be the natural evolution of all the books combined. And also, you know, just a celebration of our friendship for the, you know, many years that we've had it. So that's how that came. How do you channel spirituality in your art? And, and how do you feel, you know, how do you feel in terms of how your art affects the world or how do you want your art to affect the world? That's a, that's a different question. I appreciate that. I mean, how do I channel on a daily basis? I think that I find myself having to meditate and I often have to go into a prayerful place to, you know, bring that to the surface, so to speak. And um, there's a lot of hope involved in the process. There's a lot of faith involved in the process. And I've been doing it for so long, you know, since I was a child and been encouraged to do it that I suppose that part of it is the practice of the of the of the gift. And then how I feel about it overall, I, it's, I'm humbled by what the impact is. And I'm often learning from 
other other people's experiences what the impact brings because in some ways you just have to kind of trust that what you offer is going to do what is needed and so I think from that perspective it's very humbling well that's wonderful I mean I, I like that you meditate and and you bring it into your art because you know art changes all of us you know just looking at art moves us you know and it doesn't even matter what the art is so um there's a piece of you always in it and a piece of your spirit in it which i think is amazing um so when it comes to your work um so you um you are a mixed race child how do you think that influences what you do or the view of your world I mean, I've been exploring that throughout because if I'm a mixed race child, that means I'm a mixed race adult as well. That's the idea. But if I were to really press anybody and say, you know what that idea is, uh, I started to really embrace that being so-called mixed is is really everyone's story. If you really get down to the so-called nitty gritty of it, it's like you likely will have two parental, you know, guides that bring you into the world and their familial dynamic is, even if there's a, a vast amount of similarity, there's also gonna be a vast amount of difference. So from a cultural perspective, that's kind of how I see, well, we, we call it race, but I, I also started to see it as more of a cultural dynamic too. So how it affects us all is going to be unique. And because I've had these two very, you know, different, the cultural perspectives, my, you know, Italian side of the family and the so-called black side of the family, you know, both of those, both of those familial dynamics, like started in America for, for as, as far as I could remember anyway, but like there's an, another thread to that story that I think goes well beyond that. So those two families inspired me to go deeper. So, you know, I've traveled well beyond the boundaries of you know race i think to find that you know whether it literally is going back to italy or going back to you know the continent of africa that the storyline is much richer than often we are labeled so even in, in like embracing the idea of being mixed it's taken me well beyond that idea to you know see see deeper into who I am and who others are as well does it kind of make you feel like you're every man because you you I mean I'm you know seriously like you encompass you know two different things coming together like we all do like I'm Italian so I'm Italian American but it, that's right you know, you know whatever not everybody's Italian not everybody's American but you're bringing in right. cultural difference um race different so does that does that come through in your art does that come through in your work and 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 what about your kids like you know how does that affect them or help them right do you know where you're from in italy the word of family yeah, is yeah. From? my family is from bari bari where, where where is that is it in the north no south um my family's from bari my husband's family's from naples naples okay where is your family from? I was, I, I want to say Sicily, you know, mostly the Sic Sicilian and, but, and then I think actually I just found out recently my grandparents, my, my grandmother's parents, they have Roman, you know, from Rome kind of connections. But when I was back in the, you know, the motherland from that, that aspect of my life, I found it like, and I was in Florence for a while and these small towns outside of Florencia. And I found that, you know, it was like, I was finding a, a deep connection to that culture. So I guess, I guess if there's an every man concept, there must be an every woman concept too. So um, I think it's like the idea of adaptability came a lot from, you know, being able to connect with my grands, you know, the grandparents and having them tell me the stories that allow me the, the opening to go back into those spaces and feel comfortable. So if, you know, if comfort is about like being, you know, connected to who you are as a person in the, in the now, 
then I think that just opens the door to your ancestral connection as well. So any any time I am somewhere, I, I feel, yes, that I can connect. I mean, I've been to China and felt connected. And, you know, I don't seem like I am Chinese, look like I am Chinese, but it seemed like I've connected so well with that culture. I even had to question it while I was there. So I don't know. And then how it affects my family, my daughter is coming from, you know, two different perspectives. She is Japanese and one at one aspect of who she is. She's African American, you know, that aspect of who she is is very real too. So I think it just allows us the aptitude to see other perspectives as readily as we need to, you know, because it changes so often, especially in America. America is such a unique amalgam of like experiences. You know, when you're in China, do you get those like deja vu moments? I like that. Yeah, I mean, yes, because like walking on the Great Wall, which, I mean, it's been a while, but it's like walking on the Great Wall. I, I started to break the wall down from the perspective of what it took to build just the little section that I was on and to see the whole entire wall would have taken, I don't know, for likely months to walk that wall. It's so, so literally grand. Yeah, because I kind of feel like, um, you know, if, if you believe in reincarnation, um, that you've been, you know, yeah, you've had a lifetime there, but you've also had a lifetime in Florence, you know, both of them. You know, I know that I, I don't have a drop of French blood, and yet I can navigate the streets of Paris like I grew up there, because mm -hmm. I, there's a remembering yeah. in my soul, you know, um, you know, mm. different than, you know, if I go to Prague, I love Prague, but I, I don't feel that I belong here. I can pack up and move here, even though I like it very much, you know, so, you know, there's that always that piece of, you know, yeah, there's something here. And I really feel you have a, such a deep connection to China, you know, such a deep connection that, um, you know, on the, if you go there again, I, I would really, you know, sit in a Buddhist temple and, and feel what it feels like there because it'll come through to you. You're very open, you know, you're a very old soul you know and so you know the way it comes through to you is um is in your artwork in a lot of ways so that you process it through your art you know every artist works in in different ways and we've had artists on the show and musicians on the shows and composers on the show and everybody kind of do does their own thing but the most wonderful thing about what you do you take your past and you channel it into your art you know, even when it's commissioned art or art that, you know, you're doing for something and you have, you know, I have to illustrate this book, you're still channeling it through, which I think is, is really wonderful, really wonderful. Like David Hoffney, you know, you, you look at his art, which is kind of simple, and yet you feel it. There's something in it. You feel who he is. You know, not only do people feel who they are when they look at the things that you did, or you do, I feel like they, they feel your ancestral line and they feel your past lives in it, which makes it, you know, s remarkable. So um, I don't know if anyone's ever told that to you, um, but that's kind of what I'm hearing. Um, your ancestors are completely around you, by the way. I mean, they're not leaving you and they love that you try to figure them out, okay? Because you bring them forward, you keep them, you keep them alive. No, I appreciate that. I'm, I guess that's a good perspective. It's like one of these things that, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I haven't really thought about it. I, I have, but sometimes there, there are moments when I am in places on the earth and I do, I, I can relate to that. It's like, why am I so comfortable? You know, I don't know. I, I I agree. It's it's definitely one of those things. It's remarkable when you feel a sense of of being there and you're able to express it in other ways so that the world can see it without verbalizing it. So you you started something called Dream Studio. Can, what is that about? 
when I was in, uh, I grew up in Buffalo and uh, I had the opportunity to connect with the artist through my mo my mother. She had introduced me to a gentleman who was doing this. I, at the time, I thought it was incredible artwork. You know, he'd done these, these pencil drawings, huge pencil drawings. And he had a, a loft in Buffalo and he was doing kind of like, you know, he's living there and he was rehabbing the space. And I just was in awe of the old architect, the old architecture, and you know, just this kind of rough, rough environment, except it was very like art, you know, we call it artsy, but it's like, he just had taken something that wasn't intended likely to live in and created an art and live space. So when I, I had gotten to Kansas City after college and I'm always recognizing all the abandoned buildings all over the world actually. And at some point I I wanted to be and you know I think embrace the idea that I am an architect. So when I would see old buildings either falling apart or abandoned, I just know that that's not the original intention of the architect. So after a while, like that idea that I had from when I was a child in Buffalo had held held on, you know, throughout. And I recognized that I could take an old space and evolve it. And so I took a building that was likely over a hundred years old. And I think it's so ironic because it's about five blocks away from where Disney started his operation. And I got, you know, I basically got the ownership of the building and then took on the responsibility because I think it's that when you kind of take on a home or a building or whatever and open up this space to be able to create. And then I recognized too that the space was so grand that I felt like having others in the space as an artist was a good way to motivate not only myself, but the community around me as well. So that's, that's what it, that's what it was for a long time. And I, you know, it still remains that idea. Um, but the primary and the primary use of the space was to create, you know, have a space to be able to paint and, and be able to meditate and play music and everything I needed as well. So do other people come in there who paint or play mm -hmm. music? Yeah, when it was at its kind of like prime um, in terms of like time and, and, and what everyone was doing in the community, yes, that, that was the case. And, you know, now I find myself, you know, probably a couple, three or four years ago, started to get on the road a lot more and then focus a lot more on what I was doing with books. So it's kind of waiting for that. I think it's waiting for that rearrival at some point. And with everything happening in the world, everything's kind of slowed down. It'll come back. Yeah. And you'll be I ready agree. for it. So you've been working on a project for a while about the moment in time when Malcolm X met Martin Luther King. What, what is that about? What is that moment? I've been exploring it in this very unique way, the MM2000 idea. At first, I, I, I called it MX. 1010 or something of that nature because of the roman numeral at m and x together i think would equal 1010 but then i just you know made a decision i was like mm and then i did the research and then there it was it was like mm is happens to be 2000 in roman numeral and so the malcolm and the martin i was always fascinated by that black and white photograph of them shaking hands and you know when you learn the storyline around their kind of their politic, the idea had always been shared, opposed to us, that they were, you know, very different in the way they had their politics set up or their mindset around how they were going to get to where they needed to be or help their community to be where they needed to be. And it, it helped everyone. Like Martin was a civil rights, you know, fighter and I think Martin Malcolm Mal Martin was the civil rights focus and Malcolm that same idea was prevalent in his work um so then when the visual of them shaking hands you know hit me I'm like well if everyone says they're in a 
in opposition, then at some point they must have had an agreement in that second or however long it took to get that photograph. So maybe about four years ago, I started into, you know, approaching it. I had this incredible body of music that I had written over the years that had a very connected storyline. If you listen to the, the music in succession, and then I started to explore these angel portraits. I was doing these portraits of black and white, you know, uh, black and white photos with these painted wings. And I, I see them now as auras. And it started with those two, um, those, those portrait, them as portraits, and then it expanded. And I'd probably have done maybe four to 450 of these portraits over the years. And I wrote this uh, piece, I took 365 days to just write what I have called an imaginary diary of sorts. And it seems to be when I read back into it, like the voices of all these different characters. So inspired by the musical Hamilton and Tay was in this musical called Hedwig in the, in the Angry Inch. That's where I kind of said, let me let me move forward. Let me fight forward to create this idea called the musical. So I've just been like on a on a campaign of sharing it with people, getting feedback from people, raising awareness, and acknowledge that it came from just that photograph. So that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Where can I go to see? Um the portraits of the angels go to my instagram there's some there um if you go to the mm2000.me website we kind of uh beginning a site that shows some of the portraits i haven't released all 400 i think i mean the, i guess the beautiful thing is like work the work from children's books comes in and i have to kind of take pauses and breaks Mm -hmm. So I'm still cataloging all the work and so pulling all that together has been the next the next part of the work. Do you feel that you channel a lot of this? Like it's just coming through you to be written? Like you said, there's so many pieces to it and so many voices. Do you feel that it comes together in a way that's almost channeled through you? I almost would defer to you on this one because you... I have this sense that you're good at this and an understanding of it. I, it takes me a while after. It's true. No, I mean, it takes I, me a while after I create something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I think you're channeling it. I think there's so like, much about you. And I, I think that, you know, you, you kind of let it move through you. You don't judge it. I don't feel like you judge. I feel like it comes through you and you think, oh, aha. You know, um, like you said, there's a lot of different voices, but they're coming through you in one way so that it goes down on paper as one voice. Um, so that's kind of what I'm hearing around you. Um, and you do it, you do it in a way that is perfect for the universe. And it's perfect for people to hear and relate to, you know, because you're relatable, you know, and, uh, and yeah, that's what you're doing, you know, and you have to recognize that you're changing people's perspective just by being who you are. Like you don't need to stand on a soapbox. Mm. You just need to keep creating what you create, you know, and the angels, you know, I mean, from what you and how that happened, it feels like they just want to be present in your life. You carry a lot of Buddhist energy. Okay. Um, but I feel like I feel the angels around you. I feel the other beings around you. And if they just come out in, in your work, um, the more color you use, like not just the black and white, um, is also good for you because you like your world colorful. You know, your world is colorful. You are colorful. And so that also is a way to, you know, you talk about bringing up awareness. You're bringing up awareness just by putting out your artwork you know, or getting involved in these projects you're in, you know, um, you're not quite at the point of releasing, um, you know, the, that moment in time between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, but because I feel like it's something that your soul needs to understand, like you're, you're, it hasn't gelled yet. Once it gels, it'll come out and it'll be great. 
but you're channeling it all, you know, every, every bit of it. So, um, you know, I'm thank you for all of us who get to, you know, look at your artwork, you know, and, and appreciate it and feel it because art is to be felt, you know, it comes into all of our senses, but we feel it in our souls, you know, so it's pretty wonderful. Um, so what do you think? What are some of the things we can do, you know, to come together and heal the world? Goodness, that's a good one. I mean, the thing that comes to mind is like this, and I have to use language very thoughtfully, is kind of to be yourself. And if you, you genuinely look at each word in that three sentence, three word sentence, be yourself, each word's dynamic, you know, impact is specific. So the, the, the idea of being to be and then I like to look at it from different like linguistic perspectives too. Like if you speak Italian, like you're going to translate that into like your mind, you know, and to be like yours is not always just about self. It's not just you as individual. It, it like, there's a thread of who you, you are to be who you are today. So, and then the self, I feel like is a container. So, uh, there's a long list of also being in order to have self, in, in order to arrive at self. So I, I see a lot of times that there are a lot of humans that are on earth and, and I say this in like this humbling way again, it's like that they're not being themselves and there's a struggle in that space. So when that struggle happens, then there's a lash out and that lash out, like other people feel that. So like, how do we all come together? I think there's an encouragement towards like others and others who recognize self to encourage others to come out of that space. And it happens in an instance, like not, it's not a, yes, a lifetime is a day in so many ways. So if those awakenings can happen in, in moments, then we kind of are all better as a result. So as, I don't know, as we move through the earth, however that happens, if we're walking, if you're doing Zoom calls now, if you're speaking to people on phones, if you're like praying on, you know, praying for, praying towards, praying around, you know, I think all those energetics help lead us to this, back to the so-called self dynamic. So I don't know, it's, that's a complex question. What, what's, your thought on it I, I'd love well, to hear <laughs> well in line with what you said first of all I do believe that words hold energy okay um and so when you started talking yeah. about you know be yourself those words you know hold energy and um and they lift us up and they bring up our vibration but part of us being ourselves is speaking our truth uh, whatever our truth may be, because that's a part of us, okay? Um, and the more we, we speak our truth without judging ourselves and judging other people, okay? Breaking down the barriers, that's how the world will be healed. I mean, we came here to connect with each other, to love each other, and to heal each other, you know, instead of looking for all these differences between each other that who cares? We're all one, you know, it doesn't matter you know, what nationality, what religion, what creed, you know, what race, it, none of that matters in the scheme of things because we are all one from one creator. And once I feel like we recognize that, then we can start healing, not only mm -hmm. ourselves, but each other. And I think that this pandemic has really been instrumental in that way because we have one enemy now mm -hmm. and it's COVID, right? I mean, COVID-19 is our enemy. So globally, that's our enemy, you know, um, and that's what we're looking at. And that's what we need to keep in mind that we're all together fighting this common enemy because we are one. And once I really feel like, you know, once people get that and I really would prayed, you know, through this pandemic that people would get that, it'll be okay. And then we can heal mm. each other. But right now it's one step at a time. And so, you know, as each person stands in their truth and who they are, um, without that fear, which many people carry, it's like a domino effect and it will affect everybody. So. I see where you are. Yeah, I see that. 
Yeah, I recognize this. Like when you said the word enemy, that's a scary. It's a scary idea. Mm-hmm. The enemy mm-hmm. as an idea, like it's when you when someone's like your enemy. It's, most people are going into a defensive or combative mode, mm-hmm. unless you kind of have like embraced the idea of loving your enemy. So then, if and you know, I've had some I've had some time with the idea of the COVID idea because. If you know you talk about the impact of words, co is a, a a prefix usually that can be added to to words, and it usually means something related to togetherness, mm-hmm. community, or collective, and then vid. I had you know done some research, and it sounds like it too. It's like site based. So if you and it's from a Greek. The, you know, just the little research that I did, it's from a Greek uh, et- etymology, etymology. So if we're co-seeing together at this moment, but like, you know, we someone has branded that idea as being like an, en- an enemy, like, yes, I we don't want that in our midst. But now how do we collectively, you know, come to a and seeing is such a varied, you know, experience, like not everyone sees the same, I awe in that, you know, doing visual work, and not everyone sees the colors that I see, not everyone sees the lines as clear, and I, that's not a comparison, it's like, this is what I've been gifted, so Mm -hmm. I appreciate that perspective on it. So do you think we can love COVID? I mean, if we can love our enemy, can we love COVID? Yes, but lo- the source of love is not always about like the hearts and mm-hmm. and romance. So if we look at yeah, if we look at love and its like entirety and its complexity, then the idea would be yes, because you know, and I'm you know even that be because like be be like the cause of love and its effect it's very it's very optimally uh, um how do i say this it's it would be it would be a truth to say that a collective body of love energy could heal someone from from anything we have seen it on this planet it's not like that's a new concept so any plagues that have plagued us prior to this plague, something before technology existed. And so I would say that that would be love of all things. And so as a result, the answer again is yes. It's like, why wouldn't we be able to, you know, love that energy out of someone with with simply I say simply, but like thought is a very complex energy. So once you go go into that thought, it starts to work. It's like on a cellular level. Like, Mm -hmm. so yes. Yeah, I think a lot of people would have a hard time getting around that. But we can love Mm -hmm. what came out of COVID. You know, leaving leaving out the horrific part of it and all of that, and looking Mm -hmm. at how it brought people together you know, um, whether in their families or their communities or countries or globally, you know, there's, Mm. there's always a yin and a yang, you know, and so the positive aspects of that, of what has been going on with this pandemic have been, have been okay. They've been good. You know, it's the ability Mm. to get out of the, the painful part of it, but we grow from pain. You know, we evolve from pain, you know, it's how you look at things, you know, you know, we're complicated beings, we're complicated energies, but we all carry the spark of divinity within us. And so if we recognize that, yeah. so hopefully it's a, it's a road to understanding, you know, it's a road to be awakened. So, um, you know, and life can be good. Even with yeah, true. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I so appreciate it. And to all my listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please like, share, and comment, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much, Shane, for being on today. 
Um, I will definitely go on to your Instagram page. I look forward to seeing the paintings of the angels because they are all around us. And I love that. So thank you so much for doing what you do for the world. God bless. Same to you. Thank you so much.